into the bright wild morning. Black tea and honey. Aspen. Because I like the word and wonder how it smells. Trees were my father's language. In North Carolina, there were different pines, and I meant to ask the name, but he was gone already. What is the thing unearthed? The last lie. Find it. Fling it out into the bright, wild morning. I'm Carmel Michael, and this is Hyacinth, where we ponder beauty, anger, love, loss, fear, glory, and the unbreakable heart of human living. Welcome. I'm a writer, musician, and graduate student. Every month, I'll have conversations with diverse scholars, writers, and artists we'll get to the heart of some pretty big, beautiful ideas about the most defining, impactful, and often mysterious shared human experiences. And there'll be music, original music written for each episode, because everything is better with music. Now here's episode one, where I talk to a public historian, an urban planner, an instrument maker, and my mom, about the cultural significance of trees, Why do they have such broad and enduring significance in our collective imaginations? Why do we like them so much? And I love walking in the woods. It's almost like a meditative thing. It kind of gets gets you back behind all of the thoughts and ideas that kind of buzz around your head all day. You know, you don't want to say I'm a tree hugger because you sound like a kook. (laughs) But... uh... But I really appreciate that. But I remember a tree that grew almost horizontally that was really easy to climb. That was a very memorable tree for me. I grew up around trees, maybe more than many kids. We lived on a hundred acre woodlot. My father worked with trees, planted them, cut them, built with them carve them into stuff. Trees were central to my parents' livelihood and the aesthetic of my childhood. From tree forts and tree houses to wood stoves and bonfires, there was this entire infrastructure around the growth, management, and processing of trees. Now the questions we're asking about trees today are bigger than this, but there's something so simple about the economy of trees that governed my early life. The cycle from planting to cutting to burning and replanting, it feels whole. I can't quite set it aside as simply, well, simple. I'm thinking about this when I decide to call my mother because I've heard her say a thousand times this little thing about liking trees more than people. There's no people. There's more trees than people. That's the nice thing about the forest. (laughs) That's my mom. She grew up in the city, but somehow she's got this very articulated connection to the forest. Pine forest, the smell, the quiet, the needles on the ground, or the fir forest, the sap, the bark, you know, or come on, maples, trees, or birch? Oh, birch trees. I mean, you know. And then my mother says something so beautiful. They're so um, (laughs) non-invasive. You mean they just stand there and you come to them? Well, you go through them. They permit you. They permit you to enter. You have to realize, you know, who's letting who in. What do trees really mean to us? I mean, thinkers, artists, writers have asked this question for centuries. In fact, for a really fun rundown of tree references in literature, check out this article called The Funny Thing About Trees by Matthew Beavis. Um, He's a scholar and teacher at Keeble College, a constituent of Oxford University. He goes from Plato to Shakespeare to Samuel Beckett, from Elizabeth Bishop to Alice Oswald to Shel Silverstein, tracing this long line of questions about the meaning of trees and the effects they have on us. He writes, When inquiring minds have perceived them, trees have become metaphors for the structure of human knowledge and for humankind's place in the world. There are plenty of very famous trees indelibly marked into our collective imaginations. Take the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Bible, or the Bodhi tree where Siddhartha becomes Buddha. And that giant tree in California called uh, General Sherman, 
there are trees that survived 9-11, one that survived the Oklahoma City bombing, and a Japanese white pine that survived Hiroshima. Trees that have a story to tell about where we come from, and trees that seem to say, hey, we're still here. As Matthew Beavis writes, trees, it would appear, demand to be taken seriously. Still, there's something to be said, well, something must be said, for the practical value of trees. This is an air conditioner. Here's a group of them. It's also a water filter, an air purifier, a bike rack, a stimulus package, a therapist, a ShamWow, crime stopper, noise reducer, traffic calmer, and, oh right, a tree. Let me explain. That's from a video posted on the urban forestry section of my municipality's website. It's great to know my city takes trees seriously. And sure, we know they're good for us, but I want to learn more about the role of trees in urban spaces, and I know just who to call. So I'm Adam Fine. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a planner, and I'm working in, in wayfinding, which is helping people find their way through public spaces. So what I wanted to talk to you about is how trees factor into your specific discipline and how does someone who works in your field look at trees? Well, for for wayfinding in particular, where you're you're helping people find their way, trees often form part of the the landscape that, that guides people. Let's say if we were sending people down a trail and the trees will mark the the space so that they might be alongside the the trail on both sides and if if the trail is well done you don't ever have to put a sign up you don't have to tell people how to keep going along a along a space that's really clear and so if the you know the trees are marked along that along a trail space or if they delineate a a public space like a square you don't have to say here's a square um, the trees kind of make it seem like here's a here's a public place but it's also making people comfortable it's being um providing a welcome and letting people know that space is public so do you think that trees uh contribute to people feeling like it's a public space that they can enter or do they do they have something particular to say uh i do think when you have trees in a park-like setting they certainly they certainly make something seem welcome or feel welcome and trees have this this appeal that I don't think we can ever really replace with anything else. The, the, the shade, the, the kind of movement, uh, I don't see anywhere else. I'm just looking out my window as the wind blows through the trees and the light posts that I can see don't move at all, or maybe they move just a tiny little bit, but the trees kind of sway back and forth and they, they provide this lovely little dance with the light where they interrupt it and, and where they, you know, where it hits the road as well. Yeah. I mean, what I love about hearing you describe this is that there's nothing particularly um, scientific or pedagogical about what you're saying. It just, it's just something you know that they have this value to us that we can't replace. Mm-hmm. That's true about nature in general. I think maybe not just trees, but there have been many studies that showed that people have this kind of, uh, it's not a clear response, but a certain happiness or comfort or peace as they enter natural spaces or spaces that seem to be natural. And I don't think we yet know why that is. So trees can be guides, markers, or signifiers that help define a space and how it can or should be used. But their presence demarcates space differently than, say, a fence or signpost would. Trees invite an emotional response that gets to the heart of human nature interaction. I wanted to think more about the potential of this very particular response the trees draw out. And I wonder what factors impact the effects trees might have on one person versus another. Dr. Martha Norkunis has done some really interesting work on this. She writes about it in an article called Are Trees Spiritual? that was published in the journal Narrative Culture in 2017. Hi, I'm Martha Norkunis. That's Martha with an R. I grew up in Boston, and we don't believe in the AR combination. And I'm a professor of oral and public history at Middle Tennessee State University in their public history program. And I'm very, very interested. The thing that animates everything that I do and have done for many years 
is to think about how we can use historical and cultural knowledge to address major social issues. Dr. Nerkunis does this really great exercise with her students where she has them do interviews, asking people about how they feel about trees. Through the results of the interviews, she's learned that the identity of humans and the concept of home are linked to the existence of trees. And importantly, that trees can be a very powerful symbol for reimagining how we interact with our natural world. Think about what that could mean for the future of our climate. I always have my undergrads do, they call it EXL, experiential learning. So at one point I was having them do sets of interviews about what is democracy, and then they were asking people about questions about the environment. And so they were coming back uniformly with these very, very bleak interviews when they asked general questions about the environment. And then the other questions I had them ask were, And what can humans do about that? And the answers that they brought back were, no, I don't recycle. No, I don't conserve in any way. And there's nothing to be done. So I decided to reframe it. And I thought the idea of the environment, quote unquote, is too big for most people. And I had asked grad students to do short interviews about trees in my oral history class. I have all these listening exercises that they do. And when I had sent them out, to ask each other, tell me about a tree that was meaningful to you. They came back to the classroom and said, I think I just told this person, a relative stranger, my classmate, a very, very personal story that I've never shared with anyone. (laughs) So I reframed the undergrad exercise to think about the big environment, but in terms of their relationship to a tree or trees. And that completely changed everything. And I realized that they could talk about big environmental concerns when it was focused on their love for a tree or what trees mean or a tree that would matter to them when they were children. So what is it about trees specifically that people feel this something more about, like it can be called the sacred, it could be called the soul, it could be called just general sort of energy. What have you seen as a sort of root of this, this moreness of trees? You know, each culture has a really interesting and deep and longstanding and unique in many ways relationship with trees. And the tree has both roots in the earth, but it moves skyward into heaven. So it it's in some sense connecting the body of the person, both living and dead, to the earth, to this the air in which we live, and to the to the heavens. But there's something else to the tree. The tree is remarkable both in its interior It has this mosaic of colors, subtle and beautiful and rich hues beneath the back that changes with each concentric ring. And it has the exterior and whatever its expression is through through leaves, its branches, its shape, and flowers. So the tree is particularly powerful because of its idea that it's of regeneration. Because every winter it appears to die. You know, the leaves fall. Uh, there's just the bare branches. And in spring, it it becomes alive again. So that powerful image of the cyclical death and rebirth of the tree is really important in the human imagination. Near the end, in the conclusions of your paper, you write that um, focusing on human relationships with an individual tree may provide a roadmap to reconceptualizing the human nature continuum that encourages stronger feelings of responsibility for the natural world. And I think that's a very beautiful and hopeful thought. And I'm I'm wondering how you see that working as our world is increasingly urbanized and um, how can we engender this, this meaningful relationship between people and a single unit of nature, especially among young people, this, this generation of, of young people? How do you see your role as a historian playing into that and how just in general in our families as citizens, as storytellers, as artists, do we play into that? I think that 
One of our great roles as cultural historians and oral historians is to connect the stories that are meaningful to ordinary people back to these really significant social issues so they can feel themselves deeply involved. So it'll be through story, the family stories and the personal stories that help people make sense of their lives and their lives in the world. And if we can work with people to either elicit the stories or to show how the stories relate, then I think there'll be that personal connection and commitment and willingness to make the the changes. And I, I think that trees will be one of our beautiful guides in that process. I love this idea that trees can be messengers between the everyday and the sacred, the earth and whatever might be above. In this way, they root us in the past, but also impel us toward the future. It's as if trees, with their highly visible way of marking time in their rings and on their bark, reminds each of us that we too have a story to tell. But to really make sense of trees as a narrative force, there's one more person I need to talk to. All right, my name is Otis Thomas. I build stringed instruments in St. Anne's, Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. And, uh, I, yeah, I like to work with the, the local woods that I find around here to build my instruments. So I'm very familiar with the forest here. In 1994, Otis cut down a 250-year-old maple tree from a hillside near his home. Over a span of years, he made several instruments out of that tree. Two violins, a viola, a cello, a mandolin, a guitar, and a harp. In his wonderful book called The Fiddle Tree, published in 2010, he documents not only the process of making the instruments, but of his very particular understanding of trees, especially the ones that grow around his home and workshop. Yeah, well, I, I suppose as an instrument maker, I have a, you know, a particular angle, and that's a, an important part of how I approach my work and why it's important for me to go out in the woods and find the materials here that, uh, you know, around me. Um, you know, the wood itself is going to bring its character to the instrument. And, you know, I, I like thinking that uh, the character is somehow coming from the woods right here where I live, and it's coming out in the instrument and in its voice. I'm giving voice to a, this particular time and place. You also talk about the tree having an unconscious memory and history. And um, I'm curious about that because I feel like there's there's conscious memory and there's unconscious memory, right? We think in a, in a human way, both conscious and unconscious memory affects who we are, M maybe not even equally, maybe one more than the other. Um, I'm curious what you mean by that in the context of a tree. Well, I, I don't think a, a tree has any kind of conscious memory, but, you know, certainly, you know, the unconscious memory, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, it holds, like like anything in a way, it holds its whole history, you know, is expressed in, you know, right now, in the way it is now, in the way it has grown and come to be. And so when we sit there with a piece of wood carving it, trying to bring, you know, the best you can out of it, you know, I bring my, you know, those conscious traditions, like the history of the violin and, you know, the techniques, the way I've, I've learned and the the experiences I've had with it, and I'll bring that to the material, which is, you know, has it, its own unconscious memory, as, as you mentioned there. You know, that, that brings a, something to it that can't be quite defined, but, you know, is still, it's the important part of it. I think sometimes the most important things are the things we can't quite put the words to. So that's it. Even for those most versed in the utility, the meaning, the potential of trees, there remains always something a little out of reach about why and how trees mean so much to us. Fifteen years after cutting down that giant maple, Otis gathered all the instruments he had made from it, and their owners, 
together to record an album of his original compositions. So this whole family of instruments, all made from the same big tree, came together to tell the story of that tree in their own very special chorus of related voices. Before ending my conversation with Otis, I asked him to read a short passage from his book. If there's any final word on how powerfully a tree can tell its own story, this is it. The morning started out a glorious spring day. The sun was warm and bright, and the snow, which was still heavy in the woods, was in full retreat. We packed all the instruments up in their cases. The harp we had to truss up with ropes, blankets, and tarp to protect it during our trek through the underbrush. The hot sun softened the snow, and we often fell through up to our knees as we slowly struggled up the hill. We must have looked like a strange pilgrimage indeed with all our magical cargo fighting our way through the brush and snow. But we arrived with everything and everyone intact and we found the remains of the old stump sticking up out of the snow. We thought we should first take a photograph while the snow was still fresh around it. So we unpacked the instruments and set them up on the stump. But as we stood back to take the picture, we suddenly heard an otherworldly hum arise from the instruments on the stump. The sound swelled and grew louder. The harp was vibrating and resonating on its own, and the other instruments seemed to join in as if the tree itself were singing to us. We were all taken aback. We stood there gaping and dumbstruck, staring at the stump and the instruments while they played on alone. The sound died down, and still, somewhat awestruck, we picked up the instruments and began to play the fiddle tree as I had originally played it there in that same spot 15 years before as I was preparing to cut down the tree. Only not one lone violin this time, but an ensemble of the many voices in one. A peace settled around us in the woods as we finished playing, acknowledging a circle completed and a promise fulfilled. to thank all the guests who joined us on Hyacinth today, Adam Fine, Dr. Martha Nurkunis, Otis Thomas, and my mom, Donna Michael. Also featured in this episode is Otis Thomas's composition, The Fiddle Tree. To pick up your copy of Otis's book and album, go to fiddletree.com. And to get a complete listing of all the articles referenced in today's episode, visit hyacinthpodcast.com where you'll find a whole list of citations for the research behind this episode, lots of extras, and also be able to listen to the complete, unedited versions of my interviews with Dr. Narkunis and Otis Thomas. As always, to stay in touch, join our email list or follow Hyacinth Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Carmel Michael. Thank you for listening, and talk real soon.